Welcome to this video entitled Legal Responsibilities Part 1. My name is Joel Christensen. I'm with the Community Development Unit of Alberta Culture, Multiculturalism and Status of Women. Before I begin, I would like to mention that the goal of our board development video series is for board members of nonprofit organizations to have the basic knowledge, skills and tools to be successful in their work. We realize that some of you are not board members, and that's fine, but we want you to be aware that the information, concepts, and ideas presented are from board member perspectives. Also, the information presented here is aimed at an introductory level or as a refresher for board members to ensure that they have the base level understanding of board governance concepts and principles needed to successfully do their work. We do have other resources that we can share with you, such as our toolkit. There is a link in the description of this video to our toolkit that provides additional resources and links that we think are helpful for you and your nonprofit organization as you tackle your governance issues. Included in, the, in this toolkit is a copy of the slides we use in this video and all the videos in our board development video series. You can also hit the subscribe button down below and turn the notification on to subscribe to you, our YouTube channel and get notification about our upcoming videos. The last thing I want to mention before we get going is that in this video, we are not providing advice. The information offered in this video and the related materials are not intended to constitute legal advice, the rendering of legal concepts, consulting, or other professional services of any kind. We simply want to share with you information that we think will be helpful for board members as you navigate your organization through its governance and operations. By the end of this video, you will be able to explain fiduciary duties that come with being a board member and how they apply to board members, explain subjective and objective standards of care as part of the duty of care, and explain how board members can fulfill their fiduciary duties. So without further ado, let's get going. In this video, I will first talk about the sources of board member duties and responsibilities. And then I will talk about fiduciary duties, in particularly the duty of care. As a board member, you may have wondered where your duties and responsibilities come from. Board members have some duties and responsibilities that come from written law. Written laws are the rules that are written in laws and legislation and that you need to follow. If you are incorporated under the Societies Act, for example, in order to remain a society, your organization will need to follow the requirements and obligations that are written into this legislation. In addition to the incorporation legislation, there are other laws that you need to follow as well laws such as employment standards, tax laws, and the Human Rights Act. Though not every law will apply to your organization, board members must be aware of and follow the written laws that do affect their organization. The next source of legal responsibilities and duties of board members is common law. For now, I will just say that common law is mostly based on court decisions and includes fiduciary duties. I will go into this in more detail in a few minutes. The third source of duties and responsibilities of board members is best practices. Best practices, as the name may suggest, include effective and helpful ideas that your organization can choose to adopt. Adopting best practices can help improve role clarity within the organization and give you the tools that you need to have active oversight over what is going on in your organization. Position descriptions and internal con controls are some examples of best practices. Another example is a common policy that at least two board members need to sign all checks in the organization. With this policy in place, no one person can have full access to the organization's money. As you may know, this is not a law. You're not legally required to do this, but it is an example of best practices and it provides the board with oversight or supervision over the finances of the organization. Now the last source is voluntary standards. 
These refer to the sets of standards or rules that boards can choose to adopt in order to help them run the organization better. Similar to best practices, voluntary standards are not required by law. Organizations do not have to follow voluntary standards, but they may choose to follow them. An example of voluntary standards is Imagine Canada's Standards Program. This is a program of a set of rules that your organization can choose to follow. It has many steps in it and several obligations throughout the year that member organizations follow because it is beneficial to the operations of their organization. Looking now at this almost complete graphic, remember that we talked about how some of these were mandatory and some were optional. This arrow shows that the legal responsibilities are on the top of the graphic. In fact, everything on the top half of the graphic refers to responsibilities that you must follow. They are the laws and all organizations and boards must follow them. The bottom half of the graphic refers to voluntary responsibilities. These responsibilities are optional. Organizations can choose to adopt those things or not. In other words, you're not legally required to follow the best practices or voluntary standards, but if you do follow them, it's because you believe that it would be beneficial to your organization. Now we can look at this graphic from another view as well. As you see, this next arrow divides the graphic into more explicit on the left and more implicit on the right. The left side of the graphic is more explicit. This means that the things that are on the left side of the graphic are more clearly expressed or clearly demonstrated. Nothing is implied in those sources. Usually they are written down very clearly and you can reference them easily and know what needs to be done. The right side of the graphic is more implicit. This means they are more implied or suggested rather than expressly stated. For example, position descriptions are not the same for every organization. They may be different for every organization and may change over time. However, it is generally agreed that having them is a good idea. The focus of this video and the, vi and the video legal responsibilities too is on common law. Now we're going to focus on fiduciary duties and specifically duty of care. But let's take a look at what common law is. In addition to the legal responsibilities that board members have in written law, they also have to understand how common law affects their organization. Common law is the laws that are connected to legal precedents. In simple words, they are the decisions that judges make in the courts. Common law is a system of rules that is based on precedents. So whenever a judge makes a decision in court, that decision is legally enforced. And that decision also becomes a precedent or rule that other judges will follow in future for similar cases. Common law is unique because it cannot be found in any code or legislation and only exists in past court decisions. This fact also makes it flexible and adaptable to changing circumstances. So how is common law related to board members? When common law decisions are made in courts about boards, judges will consider the fiduciary duties of board members to make those decisions. Now, what is fiduciary duty? Fiduciary duty is a legal term and it refers to a person that has a responsibility to act primarily for another person's benefit or interest because of the position they hold. For board members, fiduciary duty is the most fundamental responsibility that they have. Board members are called fiduciaries of, uh, fiduciaries of nonprofit organizations. This means that they have a legal duty to act primarily for the interest and benefit of the organization at all times. I can tell you this, in about 75% of the consultation calls that our unit gets, the issues are directly related to fiduciary duties. These, duty, du these issues could be easily avoided if all board members fulfill this most fundamental responsibility and act in the best interest of the organization. Fiduciary duties can be broken down into two main branches. The first one is duty of care. 
and I will talk about that. And the second one is the duty of loyalty, which also will be covered in our video, Legal Responsibilities 2, where we will also have information about conflict of interest. So what does duty of care mean? Duty of care means to be informed and act with com competence and diligence to a standard of care. Board members have a requirement to act with a certain level of skill and competence. They must know what is going on in their organization and they must act with competence and diligence when dealing with all matters related to the organization. The duty of care requires board members to make informed, independent decisions. This does not mean that the law requires board members to be experts, but it does require them to act with a particular standard of care in mind. In simple words, every board member must do their best according to their personal education, abilities, skills, and experience. Well, how can board members fulfill the duty of care? In one sentence, pay attention and exercise due diligence. And by due diligence, we mean the level of judgment and degree of care, diligence and skill that a person would reasonably be expected to exercise under particular circumstances. It means that as a reasonable person, a board member must pay attention, understand the matters of the organization, and as much as they can, make the best decisions for the organization. Now, there are four things that you need to do to fulfill the duty of care. The first one we talked about is to act honestly. Board members must deal honestly with the organization. They should not act for any purpose other than the organization's purpose. Board members should also continuously think honestly about their ability to act with the organization's best interest in mind. For example, if a board member, for whatever reason, could no longer commit enough time to get prepared for and attend board meetings, they must notify the board chair of this change in their ability to commit to the board. If no other solution can be found, they may have to reside from their position on the board. This whole process is about acting honestly. The second is to, so, to show diligence. Board members must be diligent in attending to their legal duties. This means that they must be familiar with the work of the organization. They should know how the organization is structured. They should make sure that the organization has a plan for programs, services, and finances. They should make sure that they are informed about the progress of the work, and they must evaluate their plan to ensure what is working and what needs to be adjusted. Here are some examples of showing diligence, asking questions preparing for and attending board meetings, ensuring that you and your fellow board members exercise their best judgment when voting on any decisions. Avoid simply voting with the majority. And the last example I want to give you is that when you need professional advice, the board should use the services of qualified professionals. Do not just rely on what others on the board say or have heard or what you think is common sense. Ask, ask advice from a professional. The next way of fulfilling the duty of care and showing due diligence is exercising power. Board members must make decisions and they are ultimately responsible for the organization and for furthering the organization's goals and objectives. When board members are elected, they are given the authority and the responsibility to make decisions and to move the organization towards its goals and objectives. Examples of exercising power include developing standards for measuring the performance of staff and doing annual performance reviews, and ensuring that the funds that are received by the organization are used for their intended purpose and for the organization's goals and objectives. The last one we cover is to show obedience. Board members must comply with all applicable laws that are in the external and internal rules of the organization. There may be many rules that they should follow, but the most important ones are legislation, regulation, objects, bylaws, policies, board motions, and procedures. One example of showing obedience is filing an annual tax return. 
You may say that nonprofits don't have to pay taxes, and that's correct, but they still must file an annual return. So that's one example of showing obedience. All of these duties together will help you, your board, and your organization fulfill the duty of care. Now there's one thing, one more thing I want to say about the duty of care. If you remember, when we talked about the duty of care, I told you that the duty of care for board members means to be informed and act with competence and diligence to a standard of care. This means that the board members are required to act to a standard of care in the organization. But what does that phrase standard of care mean? Standard of care is the degree of care, which includes watchfulness, attention, caution, and prudence that a reasonably a reasonable person should exercise under certain circumstances. As you can see on the slide, we actually have two types of standard of care. The first one is objective standard. The objective standard, which judges all board members against the same criteria, that criteria of the reasonably prudent person that we talked about. The second one is the subjective standard. The subjective standard judges board members against their personal characteristics, attributes, skill level, education, experience, and profession. So what does this all mean in the organization? I'll tell you by using an example. Let's say that you have a legal problem in your organization and you have a lawyer on your board. It's fair to say that that lawyer will have more understanding of the legal issues and their consequences than, for example, a nurse or a comp carpenter that is on the board. So in such situations, the lawyer on the board is expected to show a much higher degree of care than another board member that does not have legal training. That lawyer is held to a higher standard than other board members. The lawyer is required to show a higher standard of care and if the organization is taken to the court, the judge will judge the lawyer based on subjective standard of care and the nurse and the carpenter based on the objective standard of care. So remember that fulfilling the standard of care is different for different board members. But also remember that this does not mean that other board members are not liable. All board members must fulfill the duty of care regardless of their profession, education, and skills. The only difference is that the degree of care that each board member must show is different based on personal characteristics of individual board members. So if a board member is trained in a matter, they are held to a higher standard of care and they are judged based on the subjective standard of care. This brings us to the end of our video on legal respons responsibilities part one. Thank you for watching. Our contact information is on the slide and in the toolkit as well. If you are in Alberta and you have a question, you need further information or would like to request our services, you can contact us through email and phone. You can also access our website to know more about our resources and services. Also, if you want to be informed of our future service and resources, you can add your email address to our subscription form and you will receive information about our services and resources as they become available. The link to the subscription form is in the description of the video as well. Thank you for your attention. Take care, stay healthy, and always remember that our communities have so much more because of everything that you do with your nonprofit organizations and your community. Thank you all and bye for now.